Hello everyone, welcome to Taiwan Bar. Today we're going to talk about Taiwan's mainland. In Taiwan, it's not rare to hear friends say they're going to the mainland, which means they're going to China to study abroad? But during the Japanese colonial period, China was called Tangshan, whereas mainland meant Japan, and our beloved Taiwan was named, well, Taiwan. But right now, it doesn't matter what place you refer to as mainland, China, Japan, or Nanto. That's not what we're going to talk about today. The Japanese rule in Taiwan can be divided into three periods. Ladies and gentlemen, in the left corner represented by Goro Shinpei, the special ruling period. Next in the middle, we have the assimilation period. Finally, in the right corner, the one and only, and we're not actually going to talk about it in this episode, the Combing Cup period. Ah, that felt good. In each period, Japan ruled in a different way. So it's been debated whether the Japanese rule was good or bad for Taiwan. But today, let's just focus on how this special ruling period transformed into the assimilation period, aka the extension of Japan proper. What exactly was extended and how did it extend? Um, <clears throat> here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, should I start? Okay. In 1895, the Japan took over Taiwan according to the Treaty of Shimonoseki, but they didn't know how to deal with this hot little potato. A group of people wanted to make Taiwan a part of Japan, so they proposed a simulation. Another group of people advocated making Taiwan an overseas colony, so they stuck colonialism in your faces. After a long jibber jabber, half of them gave way and decided to try special ruling first. By using biological principles to rule Taiwan, Godo Shinpei became the quintessential figure of this period. During the 25 years of special ruling, even though Taiwan was modernized along with Japan's westernization policy, the governor general still treated Taiwan as a colony. The biggest pain in the booty was a special law, Law Number 63, aka Law 63. What a nickname! Law 63 was the cheat code given by the Japanese government to the governor general. Any order by the governor general was made law right away. Astounding! Law 63 made the governor general a local tyrant. Even though Law 31 later replaced Law 63, it only turned a tyrant into a mini tyrant. In 1919, the whole world was going cray cray about Woodrow Wilson's idea of national self determination. That meant that all nations should have the rights to govern themselves. To people in colonies, this was like a shot in the arm. Colonialism was like, so 1918. And self determination was like, so on flee. To an imperialist country like Japan, a simulation seemed like an idea that was more kawaii. The Prime Minister of Japan at that time, Hara Takashi, went with the tide and changed the Governor General of Taiwan from a military person to an office guy, who ruled me tender, ruled me sweet. Then Kenjiro, the first civilian governor, ended the special ruling period and turned the new page to a simulation. Okay. In 1921, the Japan Congress launched Law 3, replacing the colonial Law 31. Law 3 noted that laws in mainland Japan should be equally applied to Taiwan, meaning Japanese and Taiwanese people were equal, in theory. Taiwanese and Japanese seemed equal, but that was not the case in reality. What was it like in reality? Well, you can click here to review that. Hold on. Let's clarify something real quick. I know, everyone seems to think that Asians forcing their kids to go to medical school is a new thing, huh? In the Qing Dynasty, social status was determined by achievements. For example, if someone passed the imperial examination and received an official title, you could see how the neighbors loved him as they shouted out with glee. But in the colonial period, the Chinese imperial examination was tossed and wasn't cool anymore. The governor general wanted to solve both education and sanitation issues, so medical and language schools were built to train professionals. In the Japanese period, doctors, teachers, and lawyers were the most respected and admired careers, especially doctors. With that kind of paycheck, you bet everyone wanted to squeeze their kids into med school. So the trend of becoming doctors, teachers, and lawyers has probably started a hundred years ago and still affects Miss Chen, who lives next door. In 1922, under the assimilation policy, the governor general launched the new Taiwan Education Ordinance, promoting equality among Taiwanese and Japanese students. So more and more Taiwanese can go to junior high schools, and Taihoku Imperial University, the precursor of NTU, was founded at that time. But it wasn't primarily for Taiwanese. Taiwanese thought they could receive the same education as Japanese. But in reality, the spots for Taiwanese students were so few that instead of trying to elbow their way into schools in Taiwan, many rich people would rather study in Japan. No matter what, 
the enforcement of the new Taiwan Education Ordinance still allowed more and more Taiwanese to receive education. Art and music lessons in school brought Western art to Taiwan. Traditional ink wash paintings were replaced by Western paintings. For example, Chen Chenpo's oil paintings or Liao Jichun's abstract paintings. These artists founded the Tai Yang Art Exhibition, which still takes place to this day. Music lessons in school started teaching instruments like the organ and the piano, replacing the traditional erhu and suona. Taiwan's pop music also began to flourish. For example, songs like Deng Yuxian's Wu Ya Hui and Bang Chen Hong. That's the song you're hearing right now. Now, these songs were the jam back during the colonial period. After all that talk, it seems that if Japan were Taiwan's mainland, it wouldn't be that bad of an idea. From politics, education to art, Japan has been pushing Taiwan forward. However, assimilation wasn't that positive. Education under the assimilation period had its flaws. For instance, they only taught Japanese history in school. So many of our elders, while capable of memorizing stories about Tokugawa Ieyasu, are very unfamiliar with Taiwan's past. This situation, however, is also similar to that of Taiwan's middle-aged generation nowadays. They can't distinguish Godo Shinpei from Kudo Shinichi, but can recite the history of China's dynasties without a problem. In 1984, George Orwell said, he who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. Who controls Taiwan's past today? You, isn't it? Those of you in front of the screen right now. Alrighty. After all that talking, I'm a bit thirsty. Let me finish this glass of Jose, and we'll see you next time. Salut! If you like this video, don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support us even more, you can visit our website and check out our crowdfunding options to let us make more of these videos. Until next time, see ya!